Thank you all, and uh, out of respect for everyone who I'm sure is interested in hearing uh, from panelists and asking questions of your own, I'm going to keep this fairly brief. For a lawyer, that's 15 minutes, 20 minutes. <laughs> so I'll try and keep it down so that we can really get on to uh, the, uh, the, the most significant part of the, the evening. One of the things I'd point out, actually, that was, sort of, that was just left out of the bio was when I was working, I worked for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office for 15 years, and my last five years was a public corruption prosecutor. And so I was responsible for investigating and prosecuting the judges, uh, police officers, and public officials. So I was very popular. Yeah. Um, and I actually was responsible for uncovering uh, what was then the largest police scandal in LAPD history. And I was allowed inside the Los Angeles Police Department Internal Affairs Division. Uh, the first person from the outside ever allowed inside. And what I saw was pretty horrific as far as their inability to police themselves. They were unfair to officers. They were unfair to community members. They were almost systemically corrupt without intentionally being so. And by the end of the scandal, which which did not have a good ending because of uh, political interference in the end, uh, I really wanted to have an impact on policing, not just in deciding whether or not to prosecute somebody for a crime, but looking at, at, tri at tactics and training and policy and wanting to really have an impact and the ability to ensure uh, effective and constitutional policing. Uh, when I came up with a list of suggestions on how the LAPD could better police itself, I went to my boss, the district attorney, and he looked at the list, and he says, we're not going to go there. And we were done. At that time, however, the United States was starting to create these professional police oversight organizations. And that's what led me to Portland, Oregon, to work as their police auditor. After about four years, the city and county of Denver created another uh, a police monitor program that what I used to say was it took, it took the good, it got rid of the bad, and it prettied up the ugly of the Portland program. And so I went on over there. I was there for seven years, and I felt that we accomplished a lot as far as reforms in the disciplinary process. And by the way, Sam, I'm saying process now, not process, so I'm becoming appropriately Canadianized. Uh, but, but basically, uh, there, were lot, there was still lots of resistance from the police, uh, there were lots of challenges still to go on in, in Portland, but I saw what was happening in BC. And I saw that they were creating this program, which really doesn't exist in the United States, where a civilian-led program conducting criminal investigations of police uses of force. And it's really a remarkable thing. And, and even in Canada, uh, Canada's the leader in the, in the world in this area. We've got the Ontario SIU We've got the Alberta ACER team, the uh, Alberta Serious Incident Response Team, and now the British Columbia I.O. And, uh, and I'll explain in just a moment how the I.O. even differs and, and how it's moved ahead of the other provinces. But this is a really remarkable type of program. It's a remarkable opportunity, a remarkable experience. And one of the things I looked at when I was trying to decide whether to come here was, well, first of all, I... I had heard it was the best place on earth, so I, you know, that, that had to be part of the reason to come here. But you know, what I was looking at was, what is the level of resistance or level of support from the various stakeholders? Because in Denver, I had come across extreme um, conflict with the police unions, and, and they, they didn't buy into the program, and it made it very difficult to be successful. We accomplished a lot, but it was a very long and difficult road, and we weren't even done after seven years. So what I was looking for was, is this program going to have the opportunity to succeed? So the first thing I look at is, where are the police chiefs? Where are the police executives? Do they support this program? And I saw that they did. Then I looked and I said, what about the police unions? Are they supportive? Are they against it? Are they rabidly against it? Are they generally lukewarm? And I saw that they came out in support of independent investigations of the police by this organization. And I looked at the civil liberties organizations, because if they're creating a program that the civil liberties organizations oppose, that's going to be problematic as well. And I saw that the civil liberties organizations were in favor of it. And then I looked at the primary next question is, what about the government? Is the government willing to adequately resource this kind of program? One of the problems in Ontario when they created the SIU 20 years ago was it was absolutely inadequately resourced. It couldn't do the job, and it took them about 15 years before they realized that they had to give it a budget. They had to make sure they had enough investigators and the tools to do the job. And I looked at it, and I saw a budget of $10 million a year to start up, 
and the ability to create investigative teams that could do the job right. Once I saw that all four of those stakeholders were supportive of this concept and that it was the best place on earth, that's when I decided to apply. And uh, actually, it was one year ago, this last Friday, I, I first met with uh, Minister Bond and uh, spoke with her about the job and then was offered the job. And, and I'm coming up on the year anniversary of my, uh, the announcement of my hiring. I will admit I am still in a honeymoon period. I do not expect it to last. Uh, certainly, the first controversial decision I make, I will be challenged. But what I plan to do is I've got three primary goals for the IL. The first goal is competent, fair, unbiased investigations. Obviously, we have to have that to make this thing work. If we're not doing it competently, nobody can trust the work that we do. If we're not doing it fairly in an unbiased manner, then we are legitimately subject to appropriate uh, uh, criticism, and it's absolutely unacceptable. The second goal is timeliness, and this is essential. It has taken anywhere from one to two years for investigations involving critical incidents, officer-involved shootings, in-custody deaths, for them to be completed to the point that even a decision is made whether it's going to go to Crown Council or not, or whether a prosecution is going to occur. It is absolutely unfair for the officers who are involved to not know whether they're going to be criminally charged an offense for one to two years. It is absolutely unfair to the affected persons and their families to not know what's going to happen for one to two years. It's unfair to all the stakeholders. It is simply unacceptable. And so we are going to have to change, put years into months and months into weeks. And that is a primary goal of the IO to do these competently and timely. And I've told my people, you know what? It doesn't matter how competent you are if you're untimely. If it takes one to two years to finish these investigations, you will not have the public's faith. So competency and timeliness. And the third part, which is really essential, is the, is the transparency part, the public reporting through, or transparency through public reporting. And this has actually been a great challenge just in the past couple of weeks as we've gotten cases coming in. On our first day, we had a fatal officer-involved shooting in Prince George that we had to roll out on. Since then, we've had now four officer-involved shootings and two in-custody deaths, and we've been open for eight weeks. These are all significant investigations that take an enormous amount of resources. We have dispatched anywhere from 10, 8 to 10 investigators to each incident. We had one evening where we had two fatal incidents in one night. 17 of our 28 investigators had to be dispatched on that to each incident. And so they take an enormous amount of resources. Uh, they're very labor intensive, but obviously we, we've got to get it done. Now the problem though is that the public then questions when it first occurs, the media comes to me and says, what happened? There is an incident that occurred in Vancouver today. What happened? And I can't tell them what happened. Why? Well, I don't know. And I won't know until we've investigated it. They want to hear, did the suspect fire shots at the police? Did the suspect threaten the police with a weapon? What was the weapon that the suspect had? What weapon did the police use? What was the cause of death? These are all questions, and they're absolutely legitimate questions that everyone wants to know. You want to know if an incident happened with your local police, is there a problem with it? Is there reason to have faith in your police, or is there reason to believe that the police acted inappropriately and need to be held accountable? But the reality is, and I've been holding a the tight rope with the media thus far is we, I will not state what happened without knowing what happened. I should not go in front of television cameras and to reporters and tell them this is what happened when I won't know what happened until the investigation is thorough and complete, until the investigation is complete. Now, what I now have to do if I'm not talking within the day or two after the incident is guess what? We're going to have to do this investigation in a timely fashion, and I've got to be able to get, convince everybody that there will be robust public reporting on what happened at the conclusion, and you're not going to have to wait one to two years to find out. So that's really the, the context that we're sitting in today. Now, the other thing that I, I need to point out, because this is something that a lot of people do, do not understand, is what is our mandate? What is it that we actually investigate? And so basically what the IO does is we investigate on and off-duty incidents involving police that result in either death or serious harm. So, and I can go on for quite a while on, on the challenges, in fact, in determining whether a death is really a police-related death or not. 
And believe it or not, you know, I've had hours and hours of discussions with my people trying to identify is a suicide that took place six or eight hours after somebody was released from custody, is that a police-related death? If the police officer drives up to somebody on a bridge and that person jumps from the bridge, is that a police-related death? And I'll tell you what we've come to the conclusion of is first, when you have a suicidal person and a death, there needs to be an action and a reaction for it to be police-related. So if a police officer merely drives up and the person looks at the police officer and then jumps, that's, we're not considering that a police-related death. If, even if a police officer engages somebody but says, please, don't jump, you have everything to live for, and the person jumps, not a police-related death. But if there's an action and reaction, the police breach a, a, a home or you know, break into the door and then the person kills himself, that would obviously be police-related. But there, there are significant challenges in really trying to figure out what's within our mandate and what's not. Now, the other part that's very interesting is serious harm. And the definition of serious harm is an injury that may result in death, so that's a life-threatening injury, and I think most of us could probably get our hands around that, or may cause serious disfigurement. And part of the question is, all right, what is disfigurement, and then what's serious disfigurement? So what we've come up with is basically a broken nose may be disfigurement, but it's generally not serious disfigurement. So it needs to be something higher than that. What the legislature was saying was we want the I.O. investigating serious, very serious injuries and deaths. We do not necessarily want the I.O. investigating at this time uh, less severe injuries because, frankly, at that point, we wouldn't be adequately resourced to investigate all of the incidents. Uh, then there's also may cause substantial loss or impairment of mobility of the body as a whole or the function of any limb or organ, and that's a mouthful. And again, difficult to determine. So a broken arm may not be fall within that definition, but if it's a broken arm that's not going to heal or if there's substantial medical in intervention that's required, then that would be the type of case we'd investigate. So the I.O. in general, and, and let me also point out that the off-duty aspect, so if a police officer off-duty were to drive impaired, crash and kill or seriously injure somebody, that would be our case. If a police officer were to engage in active domestic violence resulting in death or serious harm, that's our case. Off-duty a fight, that's our case. If a, an officer is on vacation up north, rolls his or her car, and kills or injures somebody, that's our case. These off-duty incidents, interestingly enough, no other province has got an independent investigations office or an independent agency conducting those investigations. So that's a, that's a place where BC is out in front of every other province. Now, as the CCD, the Chief Civilian Director, I am not permitted to have ever served as a police officer. I'm appointed to a five-year term and then I have the possibility of being uh, reappointed to another five-year term, so for 10 years in total. Um, I'm going to have to stay in BC because my mortgage is 30 years, so I've got to figure out <laughs> 20 years more, I'll have to figure out what to do. Maybe I'll teach at, S at SFU. Um, our office, myself and my investigators, have all the powers, duties, and immunities of constables of common law and jurisdiction throughout the province. So. Um, they have, my people have all the powers of a, of a peace officer to conduct their investigations. Did I give them badges? No. They don't need no stinking badges, okay? Uh, they've got credentials. Did I give them guns? No. You know, who, I don't want to try and figure out who's going to investigate an I.O. involved shooting. You know, and, they, and they don't need that. Uh, but what we are is, right now we've got 28 investigators. 50% of them have extensive police investigatory experience. So these are individuals who have uh, retired from policing. Uh, there have to be five years removed from policing in BC, but they were the group that I could bring on to try and ensure that on day one we were capable of investigating even the most serious incident, including an off-duty homicide. 50% of my people are civilians. They've never worked as police officers. They've gotten their investigative experience from areas within you know, uh, from civilian areas, uh, professional areas, which includes uh, journalism, ICBC, WorkSafe, the coroner service. That got fairly reported that we took quite a few uh, former coroners. So we've got a nice balance between former police and people who have not been police, and we're trying to create a culture uh, that is different than the police culture uh, that ensures that there's going to be accountability uh, unbiased investigations overall, and obviously I'll be reporting to you on how well we've accomplished those goals in the next year to come. Our office is located in Surrey. 
I decided that I did not want to create at this time satellite offices in the north or on the island. Uh, this is going to impact our ability to timely respond to incidents uh, because we're coming from Surrey, so if it's in the north, the southeast, the island, it's going to take us some time to get there. But I wanted to make sure that everyone was in one place, that I would be able to ensure that I could create a culture of accountability, that the former police understand what the expect expectations are, that the civilians understand the expectations, and that we create a culture within the IO that will work uh, as far as our mission, vision, and, and goals. Um, I have, it, actually, let me, let me take a step back because this is very important. So how do we find out about an incident? How does this work? And what happens is that we are notified by, or the police agencies are required to notify the IO immediately upon an incident occurring. So basically, now immediate does not mean that an officer fires shots and then you know, calls for backup and then calls the IO. But what it means is that the duty officers who learn about the shooting, learn about the incident very quickly after it occurs, you know, they're, they're monitoring their, their officer's actions, that person is calling the IO, letting us know an incident has occurred, and then briefing us on an ongoing basis as we then respond to the team. Until we arrive at the incident, the police departments are required by statute, by the Police Act, to take any lawful measures necessary to obtain and preserve evidence. So what that means is, and I've, I've said this to the police quite a lot, is so if there's an impaired driving uh, collision and you've got an off-duty officer there, you better not be standing there saying, oh, I better wait for the I.O. to get here before we take this officer in for testing. That evidence is, is temporal and it can deteriorate, and we expect that that officer will then be immediately taken to the nearest facility to have the testing done so we know what their blood alcohol level was. Uh, if a storm is blowing in, we expect them to start processing the scene. See, I said processing again. I'm, I'm very proud of that. I, I learned recently that Canada won the War of 1812. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a U.S. history major, too. Um, but basically, we, we arrive at the scene as soon as we can, but the reality is that if the evidence is deteriorating, the police have to maintain that status quo. If there is a witness there who wants to leave and they have no right to detain that witness, and that witness does not have an address and cannot otherwise be located, if there's a problem that they, whether they can be located, they're going to have to take a statement from that witness. Uh, if there are witnesses there who want to leave but who have addresses and phone numbers that we can contact them, they're going to need to take down that information because they've got to help us ensure that we can have a competent investigation. They can't just let evidence go away or let witnesses go away. And I've got to say thus far, the departments understand that and they've been acting accordingly and we've had no issues or concerns with respect to their making sure that they're taking lawful means to preserve the evidence that's necessary. And then upon our arrival, they must relinquish the uh, control over the investigation of the incident to our office. And again, they have done that within the last uh, two months. We reached uh, very early on a memorandum of understanding with the police chiefs. Uh, we spent a lot of time going over my, my expectations of the police, the police expectations and needs of the IO, and I think as a result of working on that MOU, we were able to come up with an agreement that seems to be working. It's a public document. It's published on our website. I'm going to call out, you know, BC Civil Liberties and Pivot both assisted in the development of the, of the MOU as we were developing it with the, uh, they didn't sign off on it, so they don't necessarily agree with everything, but uh, as we were working with the police agencies to figure out what the memorandum of understanding would encompass, we did seek input from Pivot and the BC Civil Liberties Association, and I think took quite a fair amount of that to the table, back to the table. There are also statutory requirements uh, applicable to police witnesses, and this is a place where things are changing, I think, dramatically. First, under the Police Act, uh, we designate, the IO designates whether an officer is a witness or a subject officer. And that actually becomes a very important distinction. If they're a witness officer, they are not, uh, we're saying that they are not uh, potentially subject to criminal liability. If they're a subject officer, they have potential jeopardy. It, once we've designated them as a witness, they are required to cooperate with our investigators. They must make a statement to our investigators, and they must make a statement to our investigators at the time and place of our choosing. Now, there's been great debates in the police community over how long you should wait before taking a statement from the police. 
my answer is we need to take the statement from the police as soon as we possibly can. And so in the MOU, we specifically state that I expect that statements will be taken either before the end of the shift or within 24 hours afterwards. If it's not taken within that period of time, I expect there to be uh, objective reasons why. So if it's not going to be within 24 hours of that incident, I want to know why, and there better be a good reason for it. Otherwise, they're going to be interviewed within that period. Um, Under these circumstances, we can, in essence, compel the witness officers to cooperate, and under that circumstance, we cannot use the statement that they made against them in court because it's considered a compelled statement. Um, My job as the CCD, I'm going to take a step away from investigations and say that there's another part of the job that's obviously essential. So the first part is making sure we've got investigations of integrity, making sure they're done timely, and then publicly reporting out on them. But I have a responsibility as a gatekeeper under the Police Act, under the IO portion of the Police Act. And my job uh, is to determine whether or not, once the investigation is complete, I have to determine whether or not the officer may have committed a criminal act. If I believe an officer may have committed a criminal act, I'm required to send the case to Crown Counsel. Crown Counsel maintains their independence, and they decide in the end whether or not the officer will be charged. That's not my decision. My decision is whether to refer it to Crown. If I do not believe that an officer may have committed a criminal act, then it is my job to close the case without a referral to Crown. And under that circumstance, that's when the public can expect a robust report explaining why. The reality is that uh, you know, I, I may have made my name in a prosecution of police officers and public officials, but the reality is the first time that I do not send a case to Crown in a controversial incident, if I don't explain why, people will be legitimately upset, angry, or outraged. The public has a right to have enough information that each individual person can reach their own determination as to whether my decision, may, was, my decision was appropriate or not. And so these decisions are going to have to be robust in the sense that they're not conclusory, that they lay out the information that I had placed before me that resulted in me making this ultimate decision. Let me, find, let me finish up with the question of the mandate and kind of going back to the mandate. And I'll tell you that one of the questions that I'm often asked is, well, is sexual assault serious harm? And my answer is that ethically and morally, yes. Legally, no, unless it results in death or this serious type of bodily injury that I described previously. So currently, we do not have the mandate or jurisdiction to investigate allegations of sexual assault against police officers unless they have resulted in, the incident has resulted in death or serious harm. Now, what the government has done, is they've, or the legislature has done, is they created a statute where, by regulation, our mandate can be increased if and when appropriate. I have said from the very beginning we have to walk before we run. So I actually am very I'm pleased that we weren't given a mandate that included every possible allegation of, of, of a crime against a police officer because, frankly, we'd be set up for failure. Uh, we need the opportunity to succeed. We need the opportunity to walk before we run. We need the opportunity to prove we can do these cases first. At that point, if we're showing competency... If we're being timely, then at that point, the government will have the opportunity to amend or or enact regulations that can increase our mandate. And they can pick and choose specific uh, statutes, statutory violations that we should be investigating. They can pick or choose uh, to what extent our mandate will be increased. And so I obviously look forward to the time when I can prove that we're doing this job adequately and correctly and that there's an opportunity to increase our mandate to do more uh, and to do what the public needs and expects us to do. For now, we've got some very serious cases we're handling. Um, this is definitely trial by fire. You know, our, I've said repeatedly our resources have been, uh, are now completely resourced. On our, our, one of the things I said to people at the beginning that was interesting was I said on day one, we had to be ready for anything, including a fatal officer-involved shooting in Prince George. And I said this well before we started out uh, up on, on September 10th. We announced our opening, and eight hours later, there was a fatal officer-involved shooting in Prince George. So um, 
I think we were able to roll out to that fairly effectively. Effectively, You all will have an opportunity to see the quality of the investigation and its conclusion. And now what I've told my investigators is we've shown we're able to roll out. We've shown we're able to get this information quickly and, you know, and get back to the office to do the follow-up investigation. Now show me that we can complete these investigations in a timely fashion so that I can write these reports, publicly report to the community, or send the cases to Crown that need to be sent. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to our uh, facilitator to continue with the rest of the evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. We have uh, four uh, panelists who are going to be responding, then we'll have some time for uh, conversation and, and questions for the audience. They're all going to be speaking for about uh, 10 minutes each. Uh, we have with us uh, Preston Ganu from Carrier Sakani Family Services, uh, Bonnie Fournier, a former uh, registered psychiatric nurse who's done a lot of work in the downtown east side, Doug King from Pivot Legal Society, and David Eby from BC Civil Liberties uh, Association. I'll give them a fuller introduction as they come up. Uh, next will be uh, Preston Ganu. He's uh, from the Nishka Nation, working for the Carrier Sakani Family Services in Prince George. We're really lucky to have him here today. We're otherwise going to be bringing him in by uh, Skype. He previously worked for the Representative for Children and Youth Office in the North Region Child and Youth Advocate and also held the Youth Justice Portfolio for the Reps Office. He's worked extensively on the issue of youth rights and police throughout the province and continues to work in the area of social justice for Aboriginal people, especially for Aboriginal youth. I ask you to join me in welcoming Preston Ganu. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Coast Salish. I want to thank the people for coming out for a very important discussion. Uh, my name again is Preston Ganu from the Niskat Nation. My traditional name is Helda Weiss, and it is an honor to be here to, to raise some very important questions and issues regarding the North. In terms of uh, this office, this new office is oversight office. I mean, one thing we can state is in the North there, we are cautiously optimistic. We understand the importance of oversight, but it has to be something that has legitimacy that can be reached and accessed as far north in the rural communities where I, where I work also. We understand there's an office here in Surrey. We, th we think that's a start in the right direction, but we need to have access to that in the rural communities. And before I, I go into the slides here, I want to frame the mentality, the experience of First Nations in the north in terms of how and what we're dealing with when we talk about accountability of law enforcement. So we need to look back to the relationship in terms of how this is described. What is the relationship between police and Aboriginal people? And this is important for Mr. Rosenthal to understand, given the dynamics that are certainly different than the lower mainland from Prince George North. Over 50% of the province there, there's number, a, a number of First Nations communities that uh, are optimistic for this office here. But again, going back to my earlier comment there, is this office going to be accessible? Is this going to stand up for the rights of First Nations when they're in conflict and harmed by RCMP? So in terms of uh, the history and framed, 1992, at the time, Attorney General Wally Opal commissioned a report called the Inquiry on Policing. So he took a snapshot of the policing in BC and what he came up with in particular for the First Nations community and police, the relationship was described as mistrust and antagonism. So 1992, we're back to 2012, I can assure you unfortunately that this relationship has had minimal progress in that area. So we look to an office, an oversight office to help assist with this relationship because we'll often hear in particular from law enforcement they're quick to use public safety, public confidence, accountability. Those are the three goals we're looking for also in the north. Unfortunately, these images here are, are burned in the memories of a lot of First Nations, in particular the youth that I work for. These are examples of situations that our people came in conflict with the system. 
And in, in this situation, the Oka crisis, although that's in a different province there, it rooted from a dis disruption between the police and the First Nations. And it erupted and exploded into the military being turned loose on the First Nations. Here in BC, 1995, over a, a dispute over a Sundance ceremony and the property that it was on, the RCMP were called in to basically remove what they termed as terrorists that were on the territory there. And again, this is important to frame our relationship with the police, the historical relationship. Even though we're talking about 1995, this is still alive and well in our, in our communities. More recently, the unfortunate missing women situation. And again, when we talk about that, I mean, that could be a whole different discussion altogether. The inadequate response by police is another example in terms of how and why we need to change this relationship. Majority of the women on that list are First Nations. And again, to say it uh, very uh, frankly, the police fail to adequately respond to a situation. Another incident here, here in Vancouver is the Frank Paul incident. And again, these are issues that are unresolved in the, in the perspective of the First Nations. And again, we worked actively on this when I worked here in Vancouver. We were able to access the video to actually see what happened, the surveillance video there. So what is presented in the media was certainly different than what we've seen in the boardroom with the VPD. So that's important for people to understand there. And I really hope the group here not only questions what I'm saying, but question and take a critical look at this new oversight body and find out exactly how much power does this office have and how can we better use this office for situations. So again, going back to the Gustafson Lake, in terms of uh, some of the things we're dealing with, this was a comment made by one of the RCMP officers at the time. So again, going back to the relationship, this is coming from a media relations officer from the RCMP. So when we understood and see this type of response, where is the public confidence? Where is the accountability that we were seeking? And if you look on the RCMP website, it is so many references to accountability, so many references to public confidence. So when we see this kind of stuff and experience this, we have a very serious question, legitimate question about that. So in terms of the media, again, going back to uh, the Gustafson Lake, this is uh, pretty clear in terms of how the media has been used to portray First Nations that have come in conflict with uh, law enforcement. So it's really important to question and to challenge what's being presented out there. So again, as I mentioned earlier, what, what is our interest in the North? Well, we have the same interest as the RCMP, according to their website, accountability, public confidence, and public safety. Contrary to what's presented, uh, we have an interest in that also. So we do have a common goal with law enforcement, is how we get there is, is a very different pathway. And who leads that pathway? So the way we view the situation here, we have the accountability, we have public confidence, public safety. These are wheels that need to work together in order to be effective. So when we talk about the, the wheels falling off justice there, I can give you so many examples from the North and people from the North and even First Nations in this room here can explain how the wheels of justice seem to have fallen off on certain issues here. So again, going back to the discussion tonight, you know, we are optimistic for a new oversight body. Uh, we're going to Patiently, I wait to see the results after one year. And how do these results connect with the northern BC? The rural communities that don't have the same access we do here in the lower mainland. So in particular for northern BC, there's a number of issues that have uh, you know, framed this foundation of distrust with law enforcement. And again, it's important for anybody that's interested in working with the First Nations in the north to understand how and why this relationship got to the point. And who is ultimately responsible for that? One of the most infamous cases involving law enforcement and the judicial system was the former provincial judge, David Ramsey. 2004, he was found guilty for abusing Aboriginal girls as young as 12 years old. So again, going back to our foundation of our relationship here, this is unresolved in Prince George, I can assure you that. There's been a lot of work to try and bring those officers to justice, only to be told, due to a technicality within the Police Act, we will not pursue any further accountabilities with those officers. So these are the actual charges that Ramsey got 
found guilty for. And again, within this investigation, at least two officers, RCMP, were implicated in abuses similar to what Judge Ramsey was found guilty for. So in terms of accountability, public confidence, and public safety, again, if we want to talk about how we're going to build a better future, we need to take a look at what happened in the past. And it's uh, one of the things in reviewing the independent office, their memorandum of understanding, I have a few questions just in terms of what legitimacy can they exert in the rural communities when it comes to serious harm, physical harm, and that definition there, and in particular with the use of force also, because we certainly have some issues recently with the use of force by the RCMP that we are currently trying to address. So again, this is uh, you know coming together is, uh, suspiciously looks like a toilet bowl. When we talk about uh, the accountability, the public confidence not being instilled or being displayed within the community, you have no public safety. So Mr. Rosenthal, we have some very legitimate and recent cases that we need to address in the north there, in particular in Prince George and further north. And again, we, we'd like to extend an invitation on behalf of Tribal Chief Terry Tiji for yourself to come up and meet with our community because again, if we are looking to an oversight body that has a provincial focus there, we think it is very important if you want some traction in the north that you need to be in the north and, and really hear from the community itself. Recently, we've been working on a couple of incidents in Prince George where we, being the community, feel there's an escalating level of force being used on children. So in particular, in 2011, a well-documented case of a, a young, young boy, 12 years old, being tasered in a group home. 2012, recently, this year, within an eight-month time span, I believe, the police dogs were deployed on children, Aboriginal children in the city there, with one of the, one of the children receiving hospitalization as a result of the dogs being deployed on this child. So again, going back to the mandate of this new office here, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit concerning if we're requiring for a person to actually be cause of death or serious harm. There's a lot of gray area we can look at in that, in that situation, that definition, so we hope that we can expand that definition to look at these types of incidents here. Otherwise, we are going to rely on the current system out there, which, to be very frank, is uh, failing the First Nations in terms of the complaints process. So the question we always have is, where's the justice? So, again, on behalf of our communities in the north, we are patiently waiting for a system that's going to adequately address these historic issues, if not the historic issues, to show a presence in the north to really send a message to law enforcement that there is accountability that's going to be required that is outside of the RCMP. And again, that's quite a task for Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, we wish you the best for your mandate. But certainly on behalf of uh, the Tribal Council, who has asked me to present also that the discussion in the North requires Northern representation also. If you want to adequately represent your office with the North, we think rather than having experts on Aboriginal people, you have First Nations that are experts on their own communities involved in a process. Thank you. Sorry, before I get yanked here, we do have a gift for Mr. Rosenthal because, uh, you know, being in the north this time of year, uh, you're going to require some uh, something to keep you warm up there. So we couldn't pack snowshoes on a plane, bud. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Preston. Next, we have uh, Bonnie Fournier, who's a former registered psychiatric nurse who retired in 2004. Uh, she's worked with the DS Health Outreach Van and in the nurse holding cells at uh, the police station at 222 Main Street. Uh, she's also worked with Greater Vancouver Mental Health uh, Services. I ask you to join me in welcoming Bonnie Fournier. Okay, I'm armed and dangerous. You can see that, right? <laughs> well, I, 
Uh, yeah, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, very pleased to meet Mr. Rosenthal and Preston. Right on. And uh, I hope I can add some information that will help a little bit. Uh, first of all, um, I have to say that I've had a rough year with uh, the Missing Women and Murdered Women's Inquiry Commission. I attended it uh, pretty well every single day, applied for standing and was denied, and then finally given standing, and the commission lawyers asked me three questions, which I answered, and when Mr. Ward asked me one question and I began to answer it, it was interrupted by the police lawyer who objected to my the question, and all of a sudden the time ticked by, and lo and behold, Time's up, Bonnie. So that was the sum and total of my uh, testimony at the Missing Women's Inquiry Commission. Now, as far as the missing women are concerned, I, I knew most of them for the whole time they were down there. I was the last one to see Zarina Abbasway alive on the 25th of uh, August, 2001. Now, my life and the life of family members and and uh, girls, uh, sex trade workers working in the downtown east side has been absolute hell. Now, this is, I, in all honesty, I mean, this is great from Mr. Rosenthal. I'm very happy. Where was it 20 years ago? Where was it? Who was listening then? Who was listening last year? Who was listening in 2007 at the, at, uh, the Frank Paul Inquiry? They weren't listening to me. I've got the subpoena right here for me to attend to testify at the Frank Paul Inquiry. Here it is, 2000, uh, November 13th, 2007. I was canceled by a phone message the day before I was supposed to testify. I knew Frank Paul for over 20 years. I knew him very, very well as a gentle man and as a man with great, a great deal of problem, but who was loved greatly, and this is living proof here. I mean, we're still talking about Frank Paul, and we're going to have a memorial walk for Frank Paul on December 6th. I mean, this is, this, is, this is the emotion behind this man, and this is the unconscionable act done by the police officers. Now, the first time when Frank came in, he was assessed by the nurse at 312 Main and said, yes, he has to stay in because he is, he is uh, compromised. He has to stay, stay in and, and recover a bit. Very, very cold day. Whole day in February, I believe it was, in 97. And, uh, you know, he was at risk. Now, the man lived, uh, I believe it was up near Oak and Broadway. He had a, pl a place where he lived. I knew where he lived. <laughs> I knew where Frank, I had known him for many years, from in the holding cells at the Vancouver Provincial Court, and then again from on the street, when I worked on the street with the Deus Health Outreach Van. And I, were, I also knew him with CAR 87. Occasionally, the Greater Vancouver Mental Health would be in touch with us, or, or the Native court workers or Native liaison would want us to check on Frank, or maybe, maybe Al Arsenault of the Odd Squad would say, oh, gee, you want to come down and have a look at Frank? He's down at Pigeon Square. These are the communication links that we have lost that went bye-bye in 2000. In 2000. That's when the good old boys were up there and uh, all of a sudden the heart went out of the Vancouver City Police. What happened? Where did they go? They, took, they were taken over by a handful of bad apples that poisoned the crop. Now I'm talking about police officers that I knew. Alice Arsenal, Toby Hinton, uh, these are Odd Squad, Dave Dixon, knew them for years. We're talking about bullying. We are talking about ignoring. We are talking about de degrading service workers in the downtown east side, myself included. I was told at one point, and this was in 2003, uh, yeah, early 2003, not too long before my brain exploded. My brain exploded in 2003. So, uh, you know, forgive me if I have to transfer everything to this side of my head. This is the only side that works. And it's having trouble tonight because I'm nervous. But here we go. Anyway, in 2003, I was in the health van. We were stopped at midnight 
I believe it was around midnight at uh, Brandy's Hotel on Hastings Street, and I stopped there with uh, doing a treatment change on a on a fellow, and uh, uh, and outside the, the the van door there was a kerfuffle and a noise and yelling, and my driver said, "Oh, don't do that." And I said, "What's happening? I mean, I can't see." And she says, "Oh, they've he's been so and so's been taken to the ground," and I said, "Is he okay?" Well, they're. they're Police have them. The cops have them. And I said, "Okay." I said, and then I said, "Are they gloved?" And she says, "It doesn't look like it." So I thought, "Okay." I grabbed a couple of pairs of gloves and I opened the door and I said to the officers, "I said, would you like these? I mean, here they are. You know, it's, there's a risk of, of of contact with bodily fluids, especially when you've taken somebody to the ground like that. The man must have weighed all of ninety pounds. Anyway." Uh, I said, would you like these? I was told, get back in there and mind your own business. So I said, and I shut the door and continued on with my dressing change. I did go out. And my driver said, oh, they've gone now. And I said, what happened with the fellow? Oh, he's leaning up against the building. And she says, I'm sure he, he's in pain. So uh, actually, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. After that, she says, oh, he, I said, is he under control? Yes, he's cuffed. And I said, okay, what have they done? They smashed all his rigs on the, on the sidewalk. So he just picked them up from the exchange van, and the police uh, grabbed him. They threw a bag of, of clean uh, needles, uh, paraphernalia. They threw it on the ground, and they stomped on him with his, their boots. Now, here it is on the street. So is he under control? Yes, he is under control. So I opened the door and I went out with my needle bucket and my tongs and I started picking up all the, all the, uh, the debris, the uh, sharps and the, and the rest of the needles. And I'm picking them all up and the police officer said, what, do you, what the hell do you think you're doing? You're destroying evidence. And I said, well, you did that pretty good with the heel of your boot. And uh, he, says, he says, you mind your own business. You don't belong down here. Get out of here. I said, this is my business. I am making the streets safe. Just so that I offered you gloves to make you safe. Now I went back. After I collected it all, I went back into the van, and uh, the police uh, left the guy, took off. I went out and checked the man and ended up sending him to the hospital with his dislocated shoulder. He had been taken down. He was right up, and the shoulder was popped out. Now, this is, this, is, this is garbage, and this is happening, this was in, two, in 2003. So this is the change, and I'm not going to hang it on any, any particular officer. I'm just saying it happened. My driver's a witness. There's other people who were witnesses. In fact, several clients said, don't talk to our nurse that way. Don't talk to Bonnie like that. Now, they risk involvement, too, and most of the ones who are saying that are Aboriginal, you know, I mean, these are the ones who, I, quite frankly, I am ashamed over the last year to be Caucasian. I really am ashamed because of the way the First Nation Aboriginal people are treated. It's disgusting. And I'm talking about over 30 years working down here. Car 87, I was with the Vancouver City Police. Out in Richmond, I was with the RCMP with uh, Greater Vancouver Mental Health. I was with, um, uh, in the courthouse holding cells for 22 years and then walked across the street and went to the health van for 10. I mean, come off it. I know every aspect of it. But they figure, oh, she's one nurse. What does one nurse know? Excuse me, this nurse knows. This nurse knows. Dave Dixon knows. Al Arsenal knows. A lot of people know and a lot of people have gone and the ones who have retired and gone are the ones who are worth their weight in gold. I'm talking about Lori Schenner, and my uh, hat goes off to her. I'm talking about Catherine Galliford. My hat goes off to her. I'm talking about other honorable police women, such as Ann Drennan, who was a spokesperson for many years, and I believe she uh, is a spokesperson now for transit police. But these are admirable people who have worked hard for the city of Vancouver. The police chief, or the mayor of the city of Vancouver, should not be on the police board. No, that's conflict. That's political. And right now we have the ones who are responsible. It's falling down on the police. But I'm telling you that the ones who are responsible are all three levels of government. 
We've got city, we've got the mayor sitting on the police board. We've got provincial, we've got the city police, we've got uh, RCMP, we've got sheriffs who have been short, short shafted in courts and high risk, and put in high risk position handling high risk prisoners like, like Willie Picton, like Bindi Johal, like Clifford Olson. What is this? The sheriffs have them in the court all day long. Sheriffs were taken hostage in New Westminster for a fisherman who was lost his fishing license. These are issues where it's totally out of balance, and the Missing Women's Inquiry Commission was totally biased, judgmental, and they did not act in the best interest of a public service commission inquiry. Federal public service. I applied for public standing. I received not one cent. I don't want any money. I'm alive today because I have something to say. And I don't ask people to agree with what I have to say. I ask you to challenge what I have to say. The one thing I do ask is that you respect me for what I say. Because what I say is the truth. We had we have two girls, one in 2010, and I believe it was Ashley in 2010. She went out the window of the Rich, Regent Hotel, smashed on a, on a sidewalk, blood spot. 2011, Verna, out the window of the Regent Hotel. Ask me how much I know. Ask me how well I know Robert Picton. Ask me how well I know others who were lures to the downtown east side. Ask me where I live, two miles away from the Picton farm. I saw, I saw the girls go missing down here. I went home and I saw him at Coquitlam Center. I met with Serena Abbotsway at Coquitlam Center. I met with Cindy Felix. These girls are, are victims, their families are victims, and their parents and their loved ones do not have satisfaction in this. Now, I was not permitted to testify, I was not given standing, and it's because they didn't want to hear what I have to say. Why? Because I was a fly on the wall. I heard. I know, I know, I know things that went on out there. I know things from the Vancouver police, from the RCMP, from... Sorry, I do. You want me to substantiate it and justify it? Yeah, maybe in some, time, in some cases I can. But in other cases, my rule of thumb is a, is a code of silence at the time. I was not allowed to speak to Stevie Cameron. I was denied speaking to her um, until I had a, a ruptured brain aneurysm in 2003. I did speak to the Missing Women's Inquiry and, apply, uh, and, and told them exactly when uh, Serena Arapasway was last seen down at Victory Square at cross, Crosswalk. Now, this is, I've, how, do you remember you, so how do you remember her so well from that night? Well, number one, because I saw her. Every single night I worked, I saw her. Number two, what she was wearing. I told them exactly what she was wearing. I said, oh, you're going to a party. Now, last words at 10.30 at night was, Zarina, be careful. I didn't know where the party was going. Actually, it was in Wally she was going. And I thought, I said to her, House of Pain? There's another story with that. How much evidence was lost at the House of Pain when it was closed down uh, in the Wally Newton area? These are, these are things that, that are part and parcel of resolving past issues and getting to a place of healing. We're not going to get there. I mean, I'm not going to say, oh, you did this and you did that. Jim Chu, I think, is a very good police chief. I think he inherited a whole pile of crap. And he's got a bunch of mess to clean up. Just like Obama. Hey, President Chu, he's trying to clean up Vancouver. You know, this is, this is bad. And right after his appointment, the Stanley Cup ride. I mean, what more did he have to have dumped on his plate? I think that he has to be given a chance. I think that he's an honorable man. I... I knew of him before. I knew of other police chiefs before. Jamie Graham was the only police chief that I recall coming over to Dais to meet with John Turvey. And John Turvey had lots of contact with all police chiefs uh, regarding missing women, murdered women. And John Turvey passed away in 2000, and I think it was 2004. But at least he lived to see Picton arrested and charged, to see somebody arrested and charged. Not, uh, we had other people we were watching, Casino Bob, uh, who uh, 
went, got out and picked up girls in a different car every time he was on the street, from everything from Rolls Royce to, to uh, Ferraris to limousines and everything else. He was an automatic 911, and the police always responded. When we saw him in the downtown area with the sex trade workers, we call, it was an automatic 911 call. Report, uh, Casino Bob's out there. The police attended. But when we were trying to report girls missing, they're saying, oh no, we can't take a, a report from you because you're not family. You're not family. Excuse me, I was mum to these girls. I was mum, I was mum to an awful lot of First Nations men. I was mum to Asians. I don't care what race you were. I mean, uh, as it says in the report, in, in Mr. Grattle's report, uh, that, and it came out at the inquiry that a police officer made a statement I wouldn't piss on them if they were on fire. A police officer went up and, and grabbed a girl and said, get up, or went to, told the girl to get up against the bil a building, and I said, this was by the Patricia Hotel, get up against the building, and she didn't move. So she was sort of looking around, and he says, get up against the building right now. And uh, then ended up going, I'm, I'm sitting there, and I've, I've got the window down, and I'm watching this. And then all of a sudden he goes over, and he says, what are you, fucking deaf? At which point I opened the door, and I said, yes, she is deaf, and she is mute. Now, there's people here who probably know who I'm talking about. She's a First Nations woman. She's been down here a long time. She's a, she's, I love her dearly, and... Uh, Still, I'm more than willing to give her a hug. But I'll tell you, there isn't one person that if they needed me to pee on them, I'd pee on them. I'd also give them a Jolly Rancher. I'd give them a Tylenol gravel or f all. If I'm out of Tylenol and gravel, because that's what you get is f all. And that's what the prisoners responded to me when I got a little ticked off and they're bugging me saying, I need a Tylenol, I need a gravel, I'm so sick. I'd say, listen. Finally, I said, listen. Normally I have Tylenol, gravel, and fuck all. I'm out of Tylenol, I'm out of gravel, what do you get? And the whole cell says, fuck all. And you know, we all had a really good laugh out of this, including the fellow who was asking for something. So this is what you've got to keep. Fine line between laughter and tears, fine line between love and hate. And I have a great deal of love for the people in the downtown east side, the elderly, the uh, dual diagnosis, the mentally ill. They're all down here. Oh, close Riverview. Where are they going to go? They're going to come down here. Why? Because they blend in. Have they been damaged? Yes, they have. Because they become addicted. They're prime for addiction. So these are things that have to be addressed. I think that as far as, as, far as uh, serious illness or damage, serious damage, that has me concerned as well, just like Preston. You have to think about it. Okay, is the serious damage a result of being abused or sexually assaulted or maligned on duty. Hello? We've got Catherine Galliford, who's been suffering from an awful long time. That's post-traumatic stress syndrome. Oh, they say, oh, well, that's because she's an alcoholic. Okay, why is she an alcoholic? Come on with it. There's documentation. There's evidence. It's coming. Uh, there's, there's people who saw and people who know. And there isn't one other nurse who was working the streets in the downtown east side other than the Deus Health Van nurse at that time between the hours, between the hours of 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. Christmas, hey, down here. My family had Christmas dinner at 11 o'clock. 11 a.m., oh boy, fun. But that's, that's where it was. And to have someone give me a hug and say, gee, Bonnie, I don't know what we'd do without you down here. That was enough for me to come back and to work on New Year's Day and to sit there at midnight on New Year's Eve. I wasn't burnt out. This was my life. And if I hadn't had a brain aneurysm at the age of 57, I'd have still been down here. The reason I came down here, and people say, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just a rich, uh, rich white girl. I'm not rich. In fact, I... <laughs> I'm a victim of the government as well. But um, I, uh, I was abused. That's why I took this job. That's why I work in the downtown east side. I was abducted at the age of two in 1946, and I never saw my mother again until I was six years old. 
And then all of a sudden, there she is, and she scoops me away, and I'm in a whole new environment. How many First Nations and Aboriginal children is that, is that happening to? I had that. Now, well, there but for the grace of God, go I. I could have easily ended up down here. But I ended up having two wonderful women who, who looked after me and, and st- steered me down the right way and helped me. But I've never forgotten that. And when I see antisocial nursing is my field of nursing, and it's because I was there. I saw, I did, I smelled, and I have never given up. My goal in life is to, is to speak for these, the family and the missing women. And uh, that's, that's right where I'm all about. It's not that I... Uh, You've got to stop asking why we're being treated this way by all three levels of government and instead ask, why are we putting up with it? Why have we put up with it? Got to get an answer, and it's got to be proactive, and it's not going to come on November 30th. I'm sorry, but it's a, deci- it's a decision by omission, and all it's worth is recommendations, that just as, as Preston pointed out, recommendations by Mr. Opal. I have a great deal of respect for Mr. Opal. I used to give him flu shots when I worked in the, in the court. Yeah. Gave lots of police officers flu shots, too. I think uh, a few I would have liked to have used a two-inch needle on them, but uh, I resisted that. And there's a few I'd like to give an enema to these days <laughs> to make their brown eyes blue. Anyway, I thank you very much for having me here. I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonnie. I'm moving right along, I'm going to invite Doug King uh, to come up, who's the policing campaigner with Pivot Legal Society. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, that was a perfect introduction because I'm going to be a lot more boring than that. I apologize. Um, you know, I think you can probably tell from, from Bonnie's comments uh, and from Preston's comments as well that one of the most difficult things for the IIO in British Columbia is that, uh, to some degree, it's a bit of a victim of history, uh, British Columbia's history, when it comes to police accountability. And as successful as the IIO may be in the next few months, uh, to some degree, they're never going to be able to erase some of the horrific things that we've experienced as province in the past. And when we look at the IIO as a possible solution, uh, never, I think, has it been more clear to me that it is only part of the solution. That if, if we look at... Uh, how we actually get to a state where police are truly accountable in this province. Uh, it's going to take a lot more than one organization. And unfortunately, um, for that organization, it's going to talk, take a lot of healing and it's going to take a lot of um, actual, genuine thoughtfulness when it comes to some of the police issues that we've had in the past. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight, uh, police dogs, which is one of my main areas of, of work lately, the last couple of years. It's probably been the number one thing I've been focused on, and, and that's because at, at Pivot, we, we try to focus on systemic issues. The, um, I, I do want to make a couple notes about the IO before I get into the talk about police dogs, because uh, one of the things that I see that's very different about the IIO compared to organizations like BC Civil Liberties or ourselves is that um, the IIO will be looking at things on a case-by-case basis. And you may have an investigation that looks at one officer, uh, one incident, one shooting, one tasering, But there still needs to be organizations more than ever that are out there to look at the systemic problems with our police departments. Uh, And that's obviously something that Bonnie really touched on. When it comes to the missing women's inquiry, I don't think we've ever had a clear view uh, up until now of just how systemic some of the problems with our police departments are. And certainly an example of that, which I'll give tonight, is the way that we've seen police dogs deployed in our province. Uh, It doesn't have to do with one individual, one incident, one time of serious harm. Um, it has to do with an institutionalized uh, training method, an institutionalized way of looking at certain people in our population, um, and what I would argue, uh, institutionalized violence on the part of our police departments. So, um, in my opinion, police dogs is actually a good example of the accountability download that's happened in our province. Uh, when we look at some of the efforts that we've taken to get the public's attentions on police dogs and to get the police departments themselves 
to look at the issue of police dogs, it's hard not to feel like we've been left completely alone. The first thing that we did with police dogs was uh, we listened to people, and that's probably the biggest part of Pivot's work and, and really the foundation of our work. We try to be the most community-based legal organization as possible, and we want to take cases that come through our doors, not ones that come into our minds. So it was inescapable over the last two years, I think in many ways, for us to look at the issue of police dogs because we simply saw too many people coming through our doors. We saw people of all um, different ages, uh, different races, different economic backgrounds. It was actually the one issue by far that spanned almost uniformly across the province, not just in the downtown east side. So as we started getting more and more people through our doors, we asked ourselves, what are the patterns here? Why is this happening? Um, why are we seeing more police dog incidents than maybe other uses of force issues? And, and one of the first things we did is we started to use the Freedom of Information Act in our province. And the Freedom of Information Act is designed for private citizens uh, especially those who the information is about, to be able to obtain information from the government about how the government's been operated. And very quickly we realized from our Freedom of Information request that police dogs were accounting for over 50% of all injuries in the province caused by police um, and over 50% of all hospitalizations. So um, right then we knew that we were onto something, that this wasn't just an isolated incident, that there was a serious problem with the way that police dogs were used. And it's, uh, it's interesting to have Mr. Rosenthal up here because even before Mr. Rosenthal was announced as the head of the IIO, um, he was somebody who was on our radar because one of the first things we did with police dogs is we looked at where have police dogs been an issue in other jurisdictions, um, other countries? Where have the people actually um, taken a look at this before? And probably the place that stood out the most is Los Angeles, uh, the Los Angeles County and the Los Angeles Police Department. Um, not surprisingly, uh, it was one of many things that was analyzed and scrutinized after the Rodney King beatings in 1992. And uh, probably the first place that real substantial action was taken on reforming that the way the, that police use police dogs against its citizens. Um, there's one statistic that I want to tell you that kind of sums it up for me. Uh, in addition to you know this, this statistic that we realized that police dogs account for probably at least 50% of injuries in the province, uh, at least with municipal departments. We still don't have the RCMP's numbers. Uh, the other statistic that really stands out in my mind and, and really makes me feel like there's so much to do here is that in Los Angeles, um, there was a team of emergency room doctors that did a study that tracked how many dog bite cases from the police department showed up in the emergency room. And they were tracking it before the changes in legislation and before the changes to the way that they trained police dogs, uh, the way that they ch changed the way that they deployed police dogs, and before the changes, they um, documented over a, sport, a span of two years, 639 incidents where people were taken into the emergency room from police dog bites um, after the reforms were made, after the way that they changed the training to the police dogs. In that same two-year span of time, they had 66 similar incidents. So I'm terrible at mathematics, but it's like 600%, something like that. It's a lot. It's a huge huge decrease in the amount of, of dog bites. And that was the first time that I looked at it and I said, um, there's actually a huge um, room for improvement here. And, and we have almost a similar problem, problem in our province. We're seeing incredibly large number of police dog bites. How do we get those numbers lower? Um, that's when things kind of took a turn for the worst. Uh, because now I look back at it, perhaps in my naivety, we actually believed that we could go through the Vancouver Police Department we could present them with statistics, with numbers, with peer-reviewed evidence and research which showed um, that the number of police dog incidents we had in the province was inexcusably high. We filed a uh, public policy complaint with the Vancouver Police Board. We asked them to investigate it, and we gave them the opportunity to investigate it themselves uh, in the hopes that they would make some reforms. And when I say that we were naive, um, it was because, while I didn't expect it to be... Um, exactly what we wanted. I, I didn't expect the police force to come back and fulfill all of our demands. We thought at least we would make a little bit of progress. Uh, we had asked for three specific things. You know, in my opinion, they're not too crazy. Number one is just that they should keep accurate statistics of how many times their dogs are biting and how many times they're deployed. The second is they shouldn't use the dogs unless it's involving a serious offense or a serious offender. And the third is that they should just examine the possibility of changing training of their police dogs so that they don't bite somebody every single time they're deployed. 
we, uh, we gave them statistics. We gave them peer-reviewed research. We did a good six months of solid, um, never-ending research on this issue. And what we got back from the Vancouver Police Department was a completely total dismissal. Um, and it relied on one article from Florida, which was a former police dog trainer's PhD thesis, which was not peer-reviewed. And if you read it, was almost entirely opinion. And this, to me, really sums up some of the hugest gaps we have in police accountability in our province. Uh, one of the biggest problems we've had up to this point is that investigations have been done almost entirely internal. And that allows police departments to make decisions uh, in ways that no, anybody, no one else would be able to get away with. Um, in no other organization, no other government body, would you be able to rely your decision uh, completely on opinion in the face of statistics and peer-reviewed research uh, and expect to get away with it. But not only have the provinces, uh, the police departments in this province been doing that, but they've been getting away with it for decades. So uh, I would say that most certainly the IIO is, is the, a great step forward when it comes to actually clearing the air as far as impartiality. But um, we've already seen a lot of examples tonight of how limited it will actually be in comprehensively changing the scope of police accountability in the problem in the province excuse me so um so since that time um since the Vancouver Police Department pretty much threw us out the door we've been forced to take other angles and look at other options we've uh very quickly we did more research we just kept asking for more statistics and that's when we found out that a large number of youths were being bitten in the province, and that's what led us to, to working with Preston up in Prince George, specifically around one case where a 12-year-old was bitten by a police dog. Um, and we've looked at statistics specifically for the RCMP because we've become to realize that um, as much as we compartmentalize police departments in the province, more and more we're realizing how much training and mentality and the general kind of culture of police uh, has been become uniformed across the province. And when we see one problem in one department, we're not surprised to see it in other places. Perhaps one of the things that we're most surprised at is that as we started looking at almost every single police department in the province on police dogs, there was actually one department that stood out to be slightly different. Um, and I don't want to say that they're slightly different in every way. I just want to say that they're slightly different when it comes to police dogs. We were surprised to find that the New Westminster Police Department um, train their dogs differently than every other department in the province. And that at the same time, where Vancouver sent over 200 people to hospital by police dog injury, the New West Police Department sent a single person to hospital. So, again, we're presented with these shocking statistics that suggest uh, we have an almost backwards approach to the way that we deploy police dogs, and we have, practically speaking, almost no system of accountability to bring it um, any sort of change. So when we talk about effective oversight and we look at organizations like the IAO, organizations like ours also have to ask ourselves, well, if the IAO doesn't want to cover these things or isn't able to cover these things, where do we actually go? And that's why I say more than ever I've come to the inescapable conclusion that the IAO is a single piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, to give you an example, in Ontario, there is actually a separate body in addition to the SIU, which handles less serious complaints, and has had the opportunity to look at some things systemically. Uh, and most notably this last year, they've come out with a report on the G20 riots and the police response to that. Actually, I wouldn't call them riots at all. I would call them process. And the um, finally, I guess, an independent, accountable organization that's looking at uh, systemic problems with police forces across Canada. For us, the future of police dogs is, um, sadly... It goes down to political activism now. We have to look at lobbying the provincial government uh, to force police departments to make changes. We have to look at litigation and the court system and, and trying to put these issues in front of judges so that they can make decisions. But where it stands now, um, despite all the evidence and despite the statistics, is we still feel like we're completely alone on this. The organizations um, in civil society still have a profound role when it comes to police accountability. And... I would actually, actually I did say just recently, the exact same words as, as Preston. While we're cautiously optimistic about the IIO, um, certainly the one thing the IIO had done, has done for us and for me personally has proved to me just how much uh, there is a need for comprehensive accountability in this province. Not just when it comes to serious harm or incidents involving death, 
but systemic and far-reaching police accountability in the province. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. I better raise the uh, microphone here. Uh, next, we have uh, David Eby, the Executive Director of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Thanks. This is a very exciting <clears throat> night for me, uh, and I really appreciate being here um, for a couple of reasons. One is this is my last uh, presentation as uh, the Executive Director of the BC Civil Liberties Association, so thanks for coming. I'm uh, moving on to, uh, to another career. Uh, and the BCCLA has been very good to me, and I really appreciate my time there. And, uh, but also um, to be here with uh, really the personification of uh, something that <clears throat> I fought for uh, with many amazing people, some of whom you heard from tonight, uh, from Doug, Preston, Bonnie, uh, other people in the audience, uh, Cameron Ward, uh, and other folks, uh, Richard Rosenthal, for the end of police self-investigation in cases of serious harm. It's very exciting. Um, for me uh, to be here on this night with this person who we have confidence in uh, to do this job uh, in an agency that we believe has been set up in a way uh, that will address um, some of these concerns that we've had. Uh, it's a thrill. Cautiously optimistic, yes, um, but very exciting um, to be here uh, anyway. Here's why we're here. Uh, 2000, or 1992 to 2007, uh, this is our statistic for police-involved deaths or deaths in custody, one for every 16,000 people. Ontario, police-involved deaths, uh, one for every 41,806 people over the same period of time, 316 deaths in Ontario, 267 in British Columbia. Um, you'll notice that that is uh, more than twice, our number is more than twice as high uh, in terms of police-involved deaths and custody deaths than Ontario. The question is why? Why is that? Why is our number so bad? Um, we asked the RCMP whose statistics these were. Um, these aren't our numbers. Our numbers were different. Uh, they were more dire. Um, these are the RCMP's numbers, and they said they didn't know, uh, that they couldn't tell us. Um, and that is a problem, uh, the lack of statistics, lack of ability to identify trends. Why are people dying? Uh, mm, great question. Um, it seems like something that should take far more priority than it has, and we hope that it will. Um, there... Despite all the excitement uh, personally that I have about the establishment of the Independent Investigation Office, about the hiring of Richard Rosenthal, about the possibilities that it presents for independent, thorough, comprehensive investigations, uh, there are challenges that this office will face that, has, that have nothing to do, even if they do the greatest investigations. And the challenges are illustrated by uh, the case of the man you see on the screen in front of you, Paul Boyd, an animator, lived in Vancouver. Uh, he was a, uh, loved by his family well-respected member of our society, uh, had a mental health issue, bipolar disorder. Uh, he was off his medication uh, and uh, was uh, a passerby, misunderstood an interaction at a bus stop, believed there, there was a fight when in fact there wasn't a fight, called the police, the police in plainclothes attended. Uh, things escalated between the police and Paul um, to the point where Paul struck uh, one of the officers with a, a bicycle lock, you know, those little combination locks, cut the officer's head. Uh, and then ran in the middle of Granville Street where he was shot nine times by a police officer. The reason why this case uh, is so important is it illustrates the challenge that Mr. Rosenthal's office will have in winning over the public because uh, let's assume that the greatest investigation ever was done. Um, the, there is one big problem, and that is the use of experts, the experts who are hired, but not just the use of experts, but how the Crown makes decisions about whether or not to approve criminal charges in a given case. You won't know this guy, um, probably. Uh, this is Bill Lewinsky. He's the head of a group called uh, Force Options. He was the expert who was hired first by the Vancouver Police Department and then by um, the Office of the Police Complaint Commissioner to provide his opinion about what happened on Granville Street that night. Um, first of all, was the force justified? His answer was yes. Second of all, why did the officer not notice in those final uh, 30 seconds that Paul Boyd had been um, disarmed, was crawling in the street, his, his colleague was yelling, hold your fire, why didn't he notice these things before he shot Paul Boyd in the head, killing him? Uh, and he said, well, it's something remarkable called inattentional blindness, which you haven't heard of before in Canada, but it means that the officer was so focused on shooting to save his life, he did not notice that Boyd was disarmed and crawling. And um, I guess he said it quickly enough that it made sense. 
Um, but the bottom line is that his opinion, uh, coupled with the investigative reports done in, uh, by the Vancouver police themselves, resulted in the uh, Crown saying uh, there's nothing for us here and not approving charges. What they didn't say was that Bill Lewinsky runs a private for-profit school for police officers, that he only testifies in the defense of police interests. He is a hired expert for police. He says he doesn't have the time to provide evidence against police officers. Um, I don't know why the Vancouver police and why the Crown didn't ask him, have you ever testified against police? Um, because that seems like that would be something important to ask an expert. A video came to light that badly embarrassed the Office of the Police Complaint Commissioner uh, and, uh, and many others because it showed exactly uh, what the eyewitness accounts uh, had provided, which was that Boyd was there. You can see him. It's very hard to see, but he's to the left of the Jeep, uh, uh, crawling on his hands and knees, disarmed. Uh, you can uh, see that he's surrounded by police officers, and Constable Chipperfield shoots him anyway. Um, the, incidentally, the witnesses, the civilian witnesses in those vehicles were not interviewed by the Vancouver Police Department, nor were they their license plates noted or anything else. So this is a challenge in terms of scene control. Uh, but in any event, um, remarkably, uh, when this came to light, the police complaint commissioner then said, oh, we're never going to use Bill Lewinsky again. And in fact, we've got a problem with police use of force experts. The Raleigh Woods Deputy Police Complaint Commissioner told the CBC, quote, I know the difficulty we have with these use of force opinions there for the most part uh, and in favor of the police, and in my experience, bias towards the police. And I was like, what? That's something that I would say. Um, so I, I couldn't believe that the police complaint commissioner was saying that, but that it reflects the core nature of this challenge that after a couple decades of police accountability, you heard Mr. Rosenthal, we're so far ahead on this. How can there not be a pool of experts that we can rely on? The BCCLA said that there should be three principles. There's police uh, experts should be independent, personally and financially, of the police. They should be accredited by recognized institutions for what they're asked to give opinions on, and they should be credible. They should have testified credibly on both sides of the fence, both for and against police interests. And so the big question is, why, uh, why, why, why are we not using experts that have at least these criteria? Um, because it's so embarrassing uh, when uh, the case goes ahead uh, and the expert says X, and it turns out to be Y when the videotape reveals uh, what we all know, which is that there are very serious issues. Uh, Frank Paul, Paul Boyd, Robert Chikansky, um, experts playing important roles in all three of those cases, in all three of those cases, charges not being approved um, despite there being major issues, uh, in my opinion, that should have been addressed. And these videos are corrosive to public opinion when it comes to our police being held accountable. So here's, here's Robert Wright. Um, Robert Wright lives in Terrace, uh, lived in Terrace with his wife. Um, he was uh, taken into custody by Terrace RCMP under suspicion of drunk driving. He was taken to cells, uh, in cells, um, Something happened. Uh, he was taken out of cells to the hospital. He got some stitches. He was taken back to cells, taken back to hospital, back and forth. Ultimately, he was airlifted to New Westminster Hospital after three visits to the Terrace Hospital. He was airlifted to New West to the Trauma Center where he underwent emergency brain surgery uh, and is now barely able to speak. He can't uh, look after himself. He's in full-time adult uh, daycare because he is so badly brain injured. What happened in the cells? And what was the role of experts in the right case? It's happening again. The same thing is happening again. I put a question mark there because there is videotape from the cells. There's videotape from uh, where he was the scene of his arrest. Uh, the videotape in the cells, the criminal justice branch tells us, shows him kneeling, facing the wall with his legs crossed while he's being searched by three uh, armed, I assume, um, at least uh, trained police officers. He attempts to stand and he's, taken, he's handcuffed and he's taken to the ground where he smashes his head uh, causing the injury that required him to go to the hospital in the first time. The Crown said that there's no link, uh, according to the medical expert, between that cut to his head that he took from hitting his head in the cell and the brain injury, um, although it probably didn't help his brain injury. Um, in any event, uh, the medical expert played a critical role in saying that there was no link, um, but also another expert, a police expert, played a critical role in saying that the use of force was uh, uh, not criminal, um, at the very least. Uh, and um, the, the concern that we have um, is the, that the Independent Investigation Office, this investigation was done by 
New Westminster Police. But this could have been done by the Independent Investigation Office. They could have done this investigation. They could have gotten the use of force expert report, which said this was inappropriate use of force, and then forwarded it on to the Crown. Um, we understand now that the Crown actually got the use of force report and called the expert and then got some information, did some investigating on their own, which resulted in them not approving the charges that the investigator had recommended. And so clearly there's an issue here in terms of uh, what happens at the criminal justice branch, the additional investigative steps that they're willing to take. They didn't go out and get another me medical report and say, oh, we should get another opinion about whether or not this guy's head getting smashed in the cells led to the brain injury. But they did go out and try to get another use of force uh, analysis in terms of the use of force report that said that the force was excessive. And these kinds of closed behind closed doors assessments of what happened are what we're really concerned about. So um, in, in my opinion, uh, the use of experts um, is the biggest challenge. Who the experts are, where they come from, what they say, and the lack of transparency. Um, we've had to publicly demand that the criminal justice branch release the name of this expert, that the videotape be released, because the public deserves to know why there hasn't been a criminal trial. And the criminal justice branch has said, uh, um, well, they never released the name on Friday. Uh, when they issued their so-called clear statement, and they've said the videotape and the report by the expert are the property of the RCMP. And we're hopeful the RCMP will release that information, at least to the family. But, uh, but those are the challenges that we face. So in summary, uh, we want your office to succeed, Richard. We want it to succeed. It's very important that it succeeds because um, police accountability is critical to police being able to do their jobs. If people fear the police when they call 911, if they fear if something goes wrong, there will be no accountability. They won't call police. They won't cooperate with police. Police will not be able to do their jobs. This is why the police union supported the establishment of the IIO. This is why um, the police chief supported the establishment of the IIO, because it is critical um, to police serving their function in British Columbia. And it's critical to addressing the issue that I started off this process with, which is saying, why do we have more than twice as many deaths as Ontario? Um, those are my remarks of my last presentation on behalf of the BCCLA. I don't want it to end. I could just keep going. So thank you so much uh, for coming this evening.